Hello and welcome to Me on Five. This will be my last show before the summer hiatus and I actually have my summer shirt on, my Boston Red Sox shirt to celebrate summer in Maine. I think we're actually going to have like a 65 to 70 degree day here in Maine. This show is about Maine and its people and the guest I have on today is one of Maine's most important people in my humble opinion. Bill Nimitz, welcome aboard. Um, Thank it's, you. It's a sad occasion you're coming on that you are re retiring. Here is, folks, here's the picture of, uh, this is the article in the paper. Uh, Bill looking uh, uh, smart as usual, Bill. Uh, <laughs> and you did this main voice thing. How did that go? That went great. Yeah, it yeah. was wonderful. I had a wonderful chat with Catherine Lee, our online editor. And, uh, yeah, we, we went on for a while, 90 minutes. Oh, 90 minutes? Yeah. Well, well this, you know, you wind me up. Be, this is going to be short, Bill, because I've only got this, about, well, a little short page of notes. You've got okay. a five-minute show. Uh, Bill, I'm very fortunate because I know that you ha had a number of these scheduled. Uh, I mean, everybody wants to get a piece of the action when the guy is going out, right? That's right, that's right. Well, I'm happy to do it because uh, it's, been a, it's, it's been a long, long run and a lot of fun and Made a lot of great friends, you and others along the way. Well, so, what better it, time to talk about it than now? You, you, know? you uh, this is your fourth appearance on my show. I'm pretty sure, which means you have beat F. Lee Bailey by one. Wow! Uh, he was our most frequent guest with uh, three, I think, and and so you you you've now taught F. Lee Bailey. Uh, Forty five years for you. That's right. Doing yeah, this. yeah. I started at the Morning Sentinel up in Waterville yeah. in 1977. Uh, walked in off the street. I didn't even. I, I was. I'd just come to Maine with my then girlfriend, and we were just looking for jobs. I didn't even know where the newspapers were. <laughs> we went by Waterville on 995. I said, yeah, it looks big enough. There must be a newspaper here. <laughs> you know? So I drove in. This is after having been to Lewiston and uh, Bangor. Yeah. Uh, walked into their newsroom, and uh, the state editor, her name was, uh, was, at the time her name was Rebecca Becky Littleton. Yeah, uh, she's now Becky Corbett, Pulitzer Prize winner for the New York Times. Oh my goodness! Yeah, she so she she, <laughs> so she went, went along and far. Yeah, and and you she, got stuck here. Yeah, right, right. So she <laughs> she so she sits down with me and she was interviewing for a, a re, people for a reporting job, uh, and thought I was just one of them that had oh. made an appointment. Okay. So halfway through it, she says, uh, "So." When did you, did, you know, when did you we talk? And I said, well, we haven't. I just walked <laughs> in off the street. <laughs> short, long story short, I didn't get that oh, job. Oh, you didn't get that job, okay. A guy named Neil Genslinger got that job. He's at the New York Times now, too. Okay. Uh, and uh, I went back. I was in Rockland living at the time. So I was freelancing, and then a few months later, they got, had another opening and uh, called me, and Boom, off I went. You, you know, yeah. Bill, uh, folks, we've never been to dinner. We've never gone fishing together. We <laughs> meet at the studio and become friends. But that is the first thing, the second thing that you said. I'm going to read something in the paper that also yeah. connects us. But that Rockland thing, because my first job out of Bowdoin, uh, I couldn't get a job in radio announcing because of my main accent. Mm -hmm. And I was sending my tape everywhere, Portland, wherever, Westbrook. Nobody wanted me except Rockland. Yeah, because my one of my best friends, his father owned WTVL and Waterville, yep. WRKD, and when he heard my accent, he goes, "That's fine for Rockland. Go ahead." <laughs> <laughs> so I was a, a radio announcer up in Rockland. You know what I was doing in Rockland? No, I was what? doing two things. I was first uh, the guy lived in the same building we did. Had, we had a TV repair business. He needed a helper to put up roof antennas, oh, TV geez. antennas. <laughs> yeah. So I can actually drive through Rockland right now. And to this day, <laughs> I can say I put that antenna. Up on that roof. And the other job I had before I got the newspaper job was with a cleaning company. You know, it's yep. easy work, you know, easy yep. to f get work. And uh, ironically, there I am with my journalism degree, fresh out of the University of Massachusetts, <laughs> and I'm cleaning the offices of Down East Magazine. <laughs> well, I'm Bill, emptying their ashtrays, yes. you know? <laughs> Bill, I have to tell you that I, I, I love the humility of life. And, you know, I just graduated from Bowdoin. Most of my friends were going off to work for insurance companies and banks, but I wanted to be in radio. Yeah. And my, my, their pay was like, I don't know, two or three hundred bucks a week. I was getting $67, $70 a week. At, uh, mm -hmm. It was costing me more for lunch than I, I was remember. making. And, yeah. and I go, geez, it's got to be some way I can make more money doing this. Yeah. And, you know, not in Rockland, Maine, no, my friend. No. Uh, Bill, uh, so what, 27 years with, with the Portland papers, right? Actually, no longer. I came down longer. to Portland in 83. 83. So whatever that is. Oh it's almost, almost 40. 40, yeah. 40, yeah. Uh, because when I first came down to Portland in 83, I was a reporter for the Evening Express. Remember the Evening yes, Express? Yes, I sure do. Uh, yeah. And then became city editor of, for the yep. 
Press Herald. Right. And then I became uh, sports. I ran the sports department for five years. You had that years. in the article, right? Yeah. And, and then finally, uh, in '95, uh, I uh, was approached by our executive editor, and as I said in, in the farewell column, uh, as I as I as I kind of you know rose up the editorial ladder. Right. Yeah. Everybody thinks, you know, I want to be the executive editor. I want to run this place, you know. <laughs> uh, but the more I did that, the more it was gnawing at me that I really missed the writing. Yes. And I, I wasn't real wild about all the administrative stuff of running a, like, sports had about 20, right. 25 people. You know, it wasn't really what got me into the business in the first right. place. So I had always said, remember when on the performance evaluations when yes. they say what do you see the last question yeah. what do you see yourself five years you know most ridiculous question in the yeah, world right, yeah. what are you going to be doing five years from yeah. now or ten years from now yeah. and so I always used to say at the bottom of that I'd say well someday I'd, I'd really like to get back to writing and so Lou Urenic the executive editor called me down because remember Bill Caldwell had yes, re oh, he, he, Bill he had Caldwell. retired yes, yes. and he had been retired for a few, couple and of years. Everybody was reading Bill. Yeah. yeah, and we were having a heck of a time filling that slot. And so Lou said to me, pointed to that on my uh, evaluation, and said, "Are you, you know, are you serious about that?" And I said, uh, "I don't know." <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it caught me by surprise. It was a Friday, so yeah. I said, "Let me think about it." I went home for the weekend. Uh, and that's when my wife uttered those famous words on Sunday night because I was still Sunday night. I didn't right. know. And she and looked. She said, she, she, she said, "If you don't do this, you will never forgive yourself." How many years married to Andrea? We got married in. Oh, you're going to get me in trouble now. Yeah. Ninety-four. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that? Twenty-eight. Okay. This this December. So Bill, we got Rockland connection. We got the fact that you were married in 94. Mm -hmm. I was married to my wife, Marilyn, in 94. There we go. And now this connection. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my favorite quote from Bill Nemitz. It said, my problem, I love to talk. <laughs> I start little conversations. And this is what it says. People often ask me how I first knew I wanted to be a journalist. I've distilled it down to my report cards. When I was a kid going to parochial school outside Boston, on the back there was one metric that trapped me up every time. It said simply, self-control. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, I swear to God, when I was going to school just yards up the street, I used to get the same exact thing, yeah. self-control. But Bill, I'd I get a C. What would you get? It, was, it would be like a number, a check. Oh, okay. I need help. And, oh, okay. They gave us letter grades for these things. Oh, no. Right. I never got above a C. No, this was like, well, I, <laughs> I had it checked like you need help in this. Yeah, but, yeah. Bill, because I was eight years old, I never knew what self-control meant. Yeah. Well, you know, I went what to a did Catholic. It mean? Well, Catholic, <laughs> you know, Catholic school, which is where I went. Yeah. Self-control means all kinds of things, right. you know. You know, <laughs> I mean. You go can, in the bathroom. Right, right, right. But uh, it, for, for us, it was, uh, you know, you behaved. Yeah. You well, know, and also, I and I was I wasn't a bad kid. I mean, I I, I didn't. I mean, I, you know, I had my moments. Me neither. But but, but I we just used to get self control. Yeah. You and I. And I just used to love to talk. <laughs> Same here. Everyone you talk around me. Too much. Yeah. You worry me to death. Exactly. So, I yeah, I got that reputation as I went up through those sure. those grades. That this is the one that you got to. Uh, if they had duct tape, they would have put it over my mouth. Well, you know? Bill, uh, it, it, at senior superlatives in the high school yearbook, I got best dressed. Best dancer and always talking. Not talking a lot, always talking. How so that's that? followed. So were you born in January too? No, I was born in July. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, I thought maybe you were. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's what I just, I, yeah. When I read that, I thought to myself, because I've told people, I said, yeah. I said, I used to get this thing, but how, how does an eight year old or a nine year old yeah, yeah, know? Yeah. And my parents never told me what it was. Well, you know, it was also <laughs> just always wanting to, uh, it wasn't just the talking, it was always wanting to know Center of attention. what was going on oh, or what? no to see things be there i yeah, always okay. i always wanted to be there if something was happening me too you know what yeah. i mean uh if i saw the fire trucks go by you i'd chase there. them on my yeah, bike yeah, yeah. you know uh, you know i want to see what's going on i you remember i remember a nosy guy from the very beginning we had a we had a thunderstorm one day at, at our come pass through our neighborhood yeah. in, this is in needham massachusetts thunderstorm comes through bolt of lightning like like you have never heard before. In fact, it hit a tree no. in our backyard no. and then bounced off the tree, went across the neighborhood to the Bradford's house, into their house, and blew up their kitchen stove. What? Yeah. 
I mean, this was, so the tree, huge oak tree right. comes down. The, no the house is on fire. And I've died and gone to heaven. I mean, are you kidding me? The fire department I hope comes. people out watching. And you know what the best part was? There was a, we, we had Needham, little town in Needham, had oh, yeah. two newspapers at that time, the Needham yeah. Chronicle and Needham Times. And there was a guy that took photos for the Needham Times, I believe it was. His name was Robert Chalou, C-H-A-L-U-E. And, and, and so after each photo, the credit line would just say, Chalou photo. So fire department comes, everything, and then, of course, the Needham Times comes, and this guy comes, gets out of his car with the big old camera, you know, walking into my backyard, and all of a sudden I realized, that's Shalou. <laughs> Shalou is in my backyard, you know, and I thought, this is, oh my, this is the most special day of my life, and yeah, that was my first, I guess you could say that was my first uh, interaction with, with the media. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> and I'll never forget, he was like a god. Yeah. And I didn't even know his first name. All I knew was that he was so Shalou. So you, like me, and I, I remember I was writing murder mysteries at, at, at Bowdoin College as a freshman because I wanted to see my name in print. And I, mm -hmm. my first book was a law book and then the book about with me and my daughter. But I used to love to just see my name in print. Yep. And I swear that when I was back at Bowdoin, I would send press releases back about myself. <laughs> I just want my first they, would, they would print them. My first main byline, I'll never forget it. We were, remember I mentioned the cleaning company? Yeah. So we take a break. There's, there's, I, I don't know if it's still there, the Dunkin' Donuts up at the end of Main Street yes. in Rockland. Yeah. And that's where we'd take our that's right, still there. 10 o'clock break. Hot dogs there, well, I had been working during the day trying to get these freelance stories published with the Rockland Courier Gazette yeah. at the time. Yeah. And uh, I had done a story, the first one, on a guy named Earl Kelly, who was a game warden up in that area, Knox County, who, would, who was retiring. So yes. I, that's why not profile the guy. So I did this story that day, and I took a photo of him. I went in. John Hammer was the uh, editor of the Rockland uh, Courier-Gazette. Dropped off the film, dropped off the copy. This is like 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> that night... I'm at uh, Dunkin' Donuts with my cleaning crew. We're having break. Guy across the U-shaped counter, the Courier Gazette had just come out. It was a well, Thursday. Yeah. Pops open his paper, looking inside, and I look, and on page one, top there of page are. one, there's my story oh. with my byline. And and I th that's it. That's it. That's it. It was like the, it was like, you know, the heavens opened. You, I said, you know, oh, Bill, I, that, that that is the story that most rock stars tell Bobby Rydell himself. <laughs> When he's driving down the road in his car in Presley, and then all yeah. of a sudden you turn on the radio, like, hey, you got to hear this song. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I definitely wanted to get to politics today. Sure. And one of the, one of the I, have, I have questions like, what are your favorite this and favorite that? Who, who, who would you say your, your favorite, one of your favorite politicians? Oh, I would, I would have to say George Mitchell. Uh, you Same know, here? Yeah, Same here, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think, oh, my God. I just think he's at a, he's at a, yes. a, a stature and a level so, that... So we agree upon that. I, I've said that. When I first met him at Bowdoin, I went back to my uh, college uh, fraternity. Said, I, think I, I said, I just met the smartest yeah, politician. Yeah. I, I said, this guy's going to be governor someday. He's one of the first people I ever interviewed, too. It, but, well, first politicians, because he had just become... He had just, Joe Brennan had just appointed yes. him to the Senate after Ed Muskie right. uh, became Secretary of State. And I was a reporter at the Sentinel, and, and George was doing a goodwill tour, you know, top, stopping in everywhere. And they said, we want you to interview uh, Senator Mitchell. And, you know, I, I, I was you, as you green, I was as, green as you could be. Uh, and I'll never forget asking him a stupid question. I, I said, I understand you're very concerned about hazardous waste. And that's, I, I made reference to this being an issue that has recently come to the surface, yeah. not meaning to the right, pun. Yeah, yeah. And I was embarrassed as heck, because, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he laughs. Pulls out a piece of paper, says, I have to write that down, and he puts it back in. I mean, he was yeah. just the most, he had a way of well, putting you at ease. Well. And uh, I, But beyond that, all of his accomplishments, I, I went to Ireland for the, oh, good, for the good Friday peace accord yeah. and, uh, and talked with him extensively during that and have several times, many times over the years, ha had the opportunity to meet with him again. And, yeah. I'm telling you, he's in a class by well, himself. Thank you for that. Uh, we agree on many things. Uh, 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 George uh, did a, a video presentation for my legend dinner with Terry Gami. And it was the funniest thing, Joe, because they said, excuse me, Senator Mitchell, uh, these two guys having a dinner, they say they know you. He goes, I don't recognize those guys. He said, this guy looks like he might sell used cars. I mean, it was, it yeah. was, just, it was just deadpan the whole time. Yeah. Then he yeah. goes, and by the way, uh, yeah, typical George. And you know, when he did interviews later on, he would simply say to them, 
give me all the questions you intend to ask me, not one at a time. And they'd go, um, okay. And he'd, go, and he'd give a speech to answer yeah, all those questions. Yeah. Well, I always found with, uh, he was actually a very difficult interview. You know why? Because everything that came out of his mouth was a quote. Yeah, that's and, you know, true. That's you, right. usually, usually, you know, 10% yeah. of what someone says right. is quotable. But I couldn't keep up with them. Thank God for tape recorders. Yes. You know, because I couldn't. It's like you're trying to get a quote down, and he yeah. says something even better right on top I'll of that. I'll never forget that I was on a cruise ship, and he was being in, not in, questioned by the Congressional Committee on Steroids. He'd just come out with a report where mm -hmm. he named right. names and so on and so forth. And a certain congresswoman was laying into him in, in her fashion. And I'll never forget the way he said, he, or she sat in the question. She he goes, excuse me. He said, you asked me a question. And it is my duty, mm -hmm. right. my obligation to answer that yeah. question, so let me do this. Yeah. And he began to go like this, wham, yeah. wham, yeah. giving her facts and figures. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, Bill, my only federal trial was against George Mitchell in federal court. It was a perjury case. He brought a perjury case against my client. And we tried the case together, a two-day trial, and I lost it. And the jury was out a very short period of time. <laughs> Uh, thank God that my client didn't get much of a sentence. But um, <clears throat> afterwards, he introduced me to the president of the United States, Bill Clinton. He goes, Mr. President, one of the finest trial lawyers <laughs> in the state of Maine. I turned to my wife. I said, thank God I didn't beat him in that Yeah, trial. that's right. That's right. Uh, so, so we agree on the favorites. One of the people that you spent a lot of time talking about, he's running again. It's, uh, we can talk about his chances. But you closed. You said right this. You were talking about LePage. You mm -hmm. said, here's looking at you, big guy. Because you used to refer to him in that. Yeah and, yeah. and and when you used to use that comment, it was often in a sort of a, not a derogatory tone, but this, when I read this, I, I, I read, you wrote that from, a, from, 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 from kindness, didn't you? Like yeah, that? well, it's the end of the road, you, you know. Guy. And uh, I, uh, as he was, as I was still writing into this spring and he was obviously yeah. running again, I thought, yeah. Uh, you know, even if I were still, if, if I yeah. hadn't decided to retire, it would have been different this time, only because it gets very repetitive. Yes. You know, he, we, I had my fun with him. At right. times he had his fun, you know, or maybe, I guess, with me. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't know if he did. Not, but, uh, you know, he, it's, it, there's, a, there's kind of an echo chamber thing to yes. it right now. Uh, you know, I think... He, 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 as he did in 2014, his second time he ran, uh, you know, he's trying to present himself as yeah. new and improved. Yes. And, right. and he tried to do that once before. And, and uh, if I recall, I don't know if he made it all the way to the end of the campaign before slipping back <laughs> into his old ways. But, but my prediction is right now, especially him running against Janet Mills, yeah. that yeah, she, she's going to get under his skin. And right. It's going to be and, a wild and, race. And yeah. Bill, I'm going to get on just a couple of the yeah. issues that, but I just thought that was a, a nice thing yeah. for you to say. But by the way, my, my partner, Ken Altshula, uh, also leaning toward the left and being the yeah. liberal voice on that set. When he interviewed him, it was very similar. And I'll never speak to Ken Altshula again. And then, of course, as you get to know each other. Um, um, so um, favorite politician, we, we, we agree upon Mitchell without any question. Um, <clears throat> any favorite celebrities that you've come across that you... You know, oh. you might have had contact with, like, you know. Celebrities. Like, you know, running to Neil Diamond. At no, well, I ran it. I remember meeting Dan Aykroyd at the Super Bowl oh, in you New did, Orleans really? once. Yeah, yeah, on Bourbon Street. Oh, no yeah. kidding. I was down uh, early on in my, in my column writing career. I, I decided that the way to, the, there was a, the key was to find the big stories, whether it was 9-11 yeah. or <clears throat> right. Afghanistan, Iraq, right. uh, or when the Patriots went to the, with Drew Bledsoe when they went in the 90s right. with the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so uh, I went down there with a photographer, and of course, you know, you got to hit Bourbon Street. And yeah. we're walking down Bourbon Street, and, and all of a sudden there's Dan Aykroyd, <laughs> three sheets to the wind, too. Oh, yeah. So trying to get a usable quote out of yeah, him right, wasn't yeah, happening. Right, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know. Dan, how are you doing? But I, I, you know, so every once in a while you have these moments where you just kind of, uh, you know, rub elbows with people. But, uh, hey, you know, one thing I've, whether they're politicians, celebrities, whatever, they, uh, I've always found when you meet these people, you realize that uh, they're just people. Well, you know, they really you know, are. I, I you do know. agree with that, but I also say to people, yes, they put their legs, uh, the pants on one leg at a yeah, time, yeah. and they're all just people, but they're, some of their accomplishments are so incredible. Oh, yeah. For example, oh, George yeah. Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, you know, and, right. and some of the celebrities I've met, uh, 
uh, including my friend Bobby Rydell, Brenda Lee, you mm -hmm. know, people that had you know, reached so-called the pinnacle of their mm -hmm. careers. Uh, you're right. When you finally sit down with them, you realize they got the same exact concerns. Yeah, they're you know? people. I mean, and, and it's all it's it's all in how yeah. how intimidated or not you choose to be well, with them. Well, I, I, you know, you know. I I always loved meeting so-called celebrities. And when mm -hmm. I was in high school, they they, they were all come to the Brew Auditorium, the mm -hmm. Beach Boys, the Four Seasons. I used to make it my business to stand mm -hmm. there and just shake hands with because I I do believe greatness rubs off. I do. Mm -hmm. I think that if you touch somebody or you meet somebody, that whatever greatness that you thought mm -hmm. they had. Some well, you know, there are a couple of locals that I love dearly. Dave Astor. Oh uh, God, me too. And, uh, oh geez. And yeah. Bud Sawyer was one of my Bud Sawyer, one of my favorite of them, yes. people. So yeah. uh, I, I mean, th th they became friends. Well, Bill, and, uh, you know. I, as as a young boy, I was on the Dave Astor show. I'm sure. And then, Who wasn't? Yeah, well, then when I was a, a, an account executive at Channel Six Television. I sold the Dave Astor show. Oh, there you go. And I would tell David, say, Dave, my God Almighty, we, you got to get, you got to stop doing uh, the so and so song. I, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> summertime, summertime, whatever. Sure. And he would laugh. And I inducted uh, Dave Astor into the Portland Players Hall of Fame. I, I founded that Hall of Fame. And he was one of my first inductees because he was a big you know, supporter mm -hmm. yeah. of, of yeah. theater. Yeah. Um, one of the, I just, I, we only got a half hour, and I just wanted to touch this issue. As you know, I wrote a book about my daughter, with my daughter, called Full Circle, about her mm -hmm. being transgender and all the troubles and the good times and the bad times. With that. Bill, I was somewhat amazed that the Republican Party, with all the issues going mm -hmm. on with Ukraine and the economy mm -hmm. and COVID, that they would choose to have a front page article mm -hmm. that says, we are now going to go, quote, after this education about gays and and you know the, the you know the critical race theory and all that sort of stuff like they have done in Florida, mm -hmm. what 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 are they trying to accomplish? Well, I'm glad you mentioned Florida because I I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think that. Maine's Republican Party was engaging in any original thinking on yes, this. Yes, that. okay. Well, <laughs> you know, that's mean, my point. Where did come up with this? Come up it's, with it's it's just it, it's all about that base, and it's all about the. I mean, let's call it the MAGA base, the Trump base, right. whatever you want to call it. It's about it first attracting and then holding on to that segment of voters. Yeah. And the problem is, like anyone, especially like children, these this, these folks. They, they have they don't have the longest attention spans. So as you go down that road toward, you know, this is wrong. We have right. to prohibit that. We should make that illegal. Right. They the party has to keep upping its game to keep these people engaged. You know, even Trump now is losing his luster with a lot. Of, you know, he's he's becoming old hat with the, with some of these people. Right. Okay. So I think the problem is. It's they just keep digging themselves in deeper and deeper on these so-called social moral issues. And the only way to keep the base inflamed is to keep raising the stakes. So now and going backwards. In yeah, time. right. I mean, you know, we thought we thought gay marriage was settled. Right. No, apparently not. Apparently not. You know, uh, and now with Roe v. Wade about to be overturned, they're right. saying we can a, do this. That's a whole slippery we can, slope. We can uh, get on uh, uh, folks. Um, uh, we discussed the same-sex marriage on this show, whether right. it was Law on the Line. <clears throat> uh, John Baldacci was the first governor to promote it. Um, and, and I did a, a marriage ceremonies like that. What concerns me, Bill, is that there are obviously people in the Republican Party, including prominent people, uh, you know, uh, doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, judges, whatever, who are gay, transgender, mm -hmm. whatever, they are in that party. Mm -hmm. What do they? What do well, they're they in the party, but I'm not. I, 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 it depends on how you define in the party. I mean, there are a lot of people who, who are still registered as Republicans. And by these people, I mean, you know, these are the traditional yes. Republicans. This is the, you know, the the, the Olympia Snow, Sherry Huber, but, 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 you know, the, the, the long time. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And I mean, nominally they're Republicans. Yes. But actively they're not. So I mean, Bill, Bill know, Cohen would not go along. No, with that no, and 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 you and so you you don't see them engaged in party activities the way they they used to be, because and 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 that has created a void over the I'd say going back really to the Tea Party about right. twelve years ago. Yeah. Uh, that void has been filled by people who are, uh, you know, very narrow-minded, uh, very self-interested, uh, and ha and and. Are, see themselves as 
as you know, soldiers in this cultural war. And, soldiers, uh, that's so totally important. Soldiers and, in the cultural war. And it's not, it's not where the rest of the country is headed. Well, you know. I can say this to you: that I have a very dear friend, uh, and his son is gay, and he is a very um, prominent kind of Republican. Name will never be mentioned. And I wrote to him and a few others and said, "What? What?" What's going to happen with this? And he wrote back and said, well, I've been supporting certain Republican legislators mm -hmm. over the years, and I'm actually going to ask them what position you take on this gay mm -hmm. issue or whatever, mm -hmm. attacking the gays and the transgenders. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, you're, you're part of that platform, you will no longer get mm -hmm. my support. Yeah. You will no longer get my contribution. So I'm wondering what kind of a backlash is going to be. For well, there could, be, there could be on this because I think that's a lot of people thought we had moved on. We from moved that. on, and and you know there are there are other things that need to be fought, battles that need to be fought, but yes. that that's just not one of them. So I, you're, maybe there will be, but I, the, the other thing is, I, their platform has been out there for some time now. Yeah. Okay. Remember the Austrian economics and all yes. that stuff. Okay. Right. You know, so <laughs> I don't think people pay a lot of attention to okay. platforms. I think it's a way of whipping up that base. They were up in Augusta. They all get. You know, they all they all have their moment. But if your friend asks those candidates that that question or those questions, my guess is you know they're going to waffle their way right around them. And yeah, they're not going. They're not, you know they're not going to be thumping their chests over this stuff on the campaign they're, trail. They're, they're, you know, okay. they do it at their conventions, but not when they're knocking on doors. I have to tell you something, Bill. I I knew that you would make me feel better on this issue. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I, I needed some help with it yeah. because at first I was so angry. I was going to do a complete show on it, and I was yeah. going to come on, and I was going to bring Harold Patience. Yeah. And you just settled my mind, basically saying, Derry, not time to panic yet. Not time to panic no, yet. No, I mean, they'll, they, they have their... They have their right. ...group, and, 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 but I don't see it expanding. I really don't. Well, um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about was, we won't even have 30 seconds to talk about it, but that we do know that Roe versus Wade is, uh, is about to be overturned, mm -hmm. which would be a huge constitutional. Mm -hmm. They're going to be do discussing that in con law mm -hmm. classes. And we also know that LePage will run on that campaign and mm -hmm. Janet will run on the other campaign. And it's going to be happening everywhere, isn't it? Even mm -hmm. to like, you know, like the local elections. Yeah. Roe versus Wade is going to be, yeah. it's going to run. While, Su while I might add, while Susan Collins skates. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm I, sorry. I, I did want to mention yeah, that yeah, because yeah. I was going to ask you. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought it yeah. up because I didn't think I was going to have enough time. We see my, a couple of my friends from college wrote a thing and she said, I said, guess what? It's water off a duck's back. Mm -hmm. She's not running again. She has a tremendous power base. And I think that what she is saying, isn't she saying essentially she got faked out of a jock or that they, they well, waffled she, around the question? I think she wants us to be, I think she wants us to believe that, yes, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch both told her that they wouldn't mess with precedent and she believed them. Okay. And poor, poor Senator Collins, they, they lied. I'm not buying it. She's smarter than that. She knew exactly what she was so, so, up against with these right, guys. So they, and, they skirted around the issue. I mean, Don't I, worry I, about it. They, they provided her cover. And now, and I remember when, when she voted for Kavanaugh, I remember thinking, this is going to come back and bite her. We all know this is going to come back but and bite her. We didn't realize it to this extent. Yeah, well, but, I thought, I always thought he's going to, yeah. Right. The reason they're putting these guys on the court is because of Roe v. Wade. <laughs> that's the reason they're there. So <laughs> for her to now say, oh, God, that's not what they told me. This is yeah. entirely inconsistent. Right, Give right. me a break. Okay, well, yeah. you know, folks, yeah. with that, I close, we close with more cogent, eloquent uh, rhetoric from uh, <laughs> truly one of the great columnists of Maine history, Bill Nemitz. Bill, thank you Thank so you, Derry. It's been a pleasure, <laughs> as always. Had a lot of fun.